Welcome back to Bible Study, and today we are looking at the Bible readings for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, which is including Isaiah 55, 10 through 13, Psalm 65, 1 through 13, Romans 8, 1 through 11, and Matthew 13, 1 through 9, and 18 through 23. Um, but let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. So we will go ahead and pick up the thing. So just um, this is one of those times when the gospel reading is supposed to kind of guide the choice of especially the two, first two readings, the, um, the Old Testament reading and the psalm is supposed to connect. I mean, that's the concept. And then the, the New Testament reading, it might connect, but it's, it's usually more in a series. You know, like you're reading sequentially through whichever New Testament letter, usually that's, sometimes it's Acts, sometimes it's a little different. But anyway, I think that because the gospel reading is the parable of the sower, that that was very influential on the choice of the um, other Bible readings, especially that was, that was very evident this time. So, but um, I know Bruce, you don't care to read. So Johnny, I'll, I'll go with you if you will read um, the Isaiah 55, 10 through 13 for us. <clears throat> for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So on that, that last sentence, I just had this uh, kind of like thought, like instead of the tumbleweed shall come up I don't know, whatever nice bush we could think of instead, I guess. Uh, so a nice evergreen or something like that. So that's kind of the, that, uh, that last little imagery. But this, so this is coming out of a time of Israel's um, situation where they were still in exile and um, that was a huge impact on their identity. I think we, we I mean, it, a lot of the prophets are dealing with that time period. So we keep, it keeps coming up, but just quick reminder that they were um, conquered by the Babylonians. Uh, lots of war, lots of fighting gone on before that, but the final real taking down and taking away leaders was like 580, 586 BCE. And they took away key leaders, um, the higher educated, the priests, the, the political leaders, and took them off to Babylon, and they had to live there for actually decades. And so when Isaiah is now talking to them, it's getting towards the end where they're actually gonna be closer to get to go back to Israel. But the hope is kind of waning, like that this could even happen because it's been a long time. Um, and so it was, overall, it was about 70 years that they were in exile, which it's, very long time uh, but this is a reminder that God did not forget them and that God would bring this restoration and that they would get to return from exile so it's a message of of hope but it uses a lot of um, I guess you could call it agri agricultural imagery um, now I don't know 
I don't know exactly from where. I mean, when I think of the Middle East, I still do think of a pretty dry land, not as dry as we are, but but um, I mean, I'm sure there was agriculture even around um, even around the area that they were in exile in, in Babylon. I'm sure there was, but I think what is being pictured here is definitely more based on memories from what Israel was like, you know, what their, what their homeland was like. So that, that it's picturing, um, and that the, there's one thing that is kind of interesting, um, just as another awareness of the way people understood how the world was way back then. It says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they water the earth, make it bring forth, bring forth and sprout. What I find interesting about this is we now know um, about the water cycle, right? We, we, but I don't think there was an actual literal, they, they weren't scientific at this point. So they didn't know this, but yet it's actually kind of expressing that, which I find, find interesting is that, yeah, you know, the heat makes the water rise and then finally it gets cooled off enough and then it coalesces and then it drops. And I have to, I have to just mention this because I thought this, I heard about this recently and I just thought that this was extremely fascinating. But around the um, Navajo Nation, they have been able to distribute a whole bunch of these kind of panels that, are, that use solar energy to help them operate but what the panel does is it pulls moisture just out of the air. Not, not rain falling down, just literally out of the air and it pulls the moisture and it collects it so that families can have, um, I mean, it's not like a huge amount, but still it's a way that they, it helps them to have water because otherwise trucks are coming to just, you know, like fill up whatever their water container thing is. So they can literally, literally get water out of the air. And I just thought that was one of the coolest things I'd ever, ever heard of. So who knows, maybe it'll become more widespread and uh, we can have those set up in our own backyards and it can help us water plants or, I think it's actually um, not, I think it's actually done there's drinking water mostly. That's the most main use for it. But um, anyway, I just thought that was fascinating. So, uh, but the concept here is um, the way they viewed the world was um, yeah still kind of flat like they didn't they didn't have enough knowledge to the you know the world's round um, and so the world's kind of flat but they they picture it as if it's almost like a big dome set over that or like almost like a bowl you can imagine if a bowl turned upside down over that right so that they yeah and so then that upper part of the bowl had little holes in it and so the water was pushed back behind that and then when God let it it would come down again and then and then as it says it would return back there so they, they did have this kind of concept of a certain kind of the way the water would would cycle um, so this is saying uh, God is the one who causes the water to come the snow to come and in this case it's definitely life-giving and that's, that's a positive image for them because they were probably feeling very dry in the sense spiritually, uh, very lost. And this is giving them back a sense of hope. But along with the kind of um, beautiful plant imagery and life-giving imagery, um, I think this is the really, really important part of this passage though. And it's, is so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So that God's word has power, just like water has power to bring life, right? God's word has power to bring life, to change things, transform things. Um, and also, that uh, it's kind of maybe a nod back to Genesis chapter one, which uh, tells about creation. What, I mean, what is it? In the beginning, God created the heavens, the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And then when you get to day two, and God said, you know, so again, it's 
God's word makes things happen. Amen. Yeah. And so that's, that's, um, it's a really great reminder of that and that, that getting into God's word, you know, <laughs> getting more aware of God's word, but letting it really come and take up residence in us. Let it like literally dwell in us, so to speak. And um, reading devotion books daily, reading little Bible passages daily. Um, you know, there's just so many ways that it can nourish us. And I really think it can be a, a, true, a true nourishment. So, and then um, it's also, then it goes on to this, this, for you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. And that's a vision of them being led back to get out of their captivity, their exile, being led back to their homeland. And that that will be an occasion for joy. And it'll be so joyful that even, again, the environment's going to join in on the joy. And I love, I love that. And um, something else I was um, hearing, <laughs> I bless you. I love the sound of music. It was my very favorite um, musicals and movies. And so then all of a sudden it was like the hills are alive with the sound of music. Anyway, I cannot do Julie Andrews. <laughs> but um, but at any rate, that that's um, anyway, I can almost just picture that you know like her on the mountain and singing and that you know that's kind of almost the the picture that that maybe we're. I mean, they didn't know Julie Andrews, but I'm just saying that that's a picture that comes in my mind is that nature itself, God's own creation, is sharing in the joy that God's people get to go home. And I think that's that's a really, you know, fun image. And then things that were um, devastating or, uh, you know, thorny things, tough, tough parts of life are being transformed into something good, uh, either like a cypress is something good and strong, or the myrtle is something that has beauty, so into something strength and beauty, God's going to take what was devastating and bad and transform it into strength and beauty. So uh, anyway, I think those are just, there's so much great imagery in there. But as far as the Bible reading from Matthew, the key thing is they're giving seed to the sower. But I think also remembering that God's word is being like that image of God's word being spread. I think that's also meant to be carried over to Matthew. All right, the psalm is is a long one. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I appreciate it. But I have to say when we were doing the responsive reading on Sunday, I was like, wow, this one keeps going, doesn't it? <laughs> um, now, sometimes we've done it in the back and forth way. How do you guys feel about doing that today? We would need to do it from the, you know, printout if this kind, because the big print doesn't show it. Do you want to, shall we go for it? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, let's see, Linda, do you yeah. want to? Linda will be our leader, and we will be the responder, okay? The all. We, the rest will be all. <laughs> Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and you shall... And to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To, to you, you all flesh, flesh shall, shall come. come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy, Happy are, are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. You shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Thy awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance. O God of our salvation, you are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains, you are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are fought by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water, you water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty, 
Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The patches of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Yeah. So again, I, I th this um, it's like a poetry type expression, but it, it's again, um, especially towards the end, how nature itself um, is expressing praise or joy, um, which I like. I like that. It's um, it's almost Franciscan. You know, Saint Francis was one who was known to appreciate uh, very greatly how in creation itself you could find uh, signs or expressions of you know praising God or God's goodness or, or whatever um, yeah, big part of Native American uh, yeah beliefs. yeah there was one of my very favorite people I ever got to meet and her presentations and such uh, her name is Sister Jose Habde and she is part Native American and also but her family is also Catholic rooted and um, so and she had all brothers like she had a whole bunch of brothers <laughs> she's the only girl but anyway it was when she was older um well actually earlier in her youth she kind of had a very spiritual experience and uh i think that kind of tied into later her desire to become a, a nun and then she chose the franciscan order because her mother had taught her many things from the native, I mean, her, her mother was Christian, the, the whole family is Christian, but her mother still has shared with her certain things from native heritage. And, and then she brought that together with, you know, a St. Francis of great uh, appreciation for creation and animals and such. And that, that was a good place for her to um, kind of put it all together. And then she was leading, uh, teaching and leading and doing other things, but uh, she was really, one of the coolest people I ever ever met. But anyway, she this this psalm covers a lot, and we won't try to go into every little detail. But um, the the genre, the type of the psalm, is is called a psalm of reorientation. I know that's like ooh, psalm of reorientation, and it's it's um there's quite a few of them that of that style, and it's when something uh, very difficult in your life. Uh, whether it's individual or whether it's the community, something pretty traumatic has happened. You've prayed to God, you've turned to God, and God has um, brought you out of it. And so then, then you're also thanking God. And so, um, and that's pretty obvious, like right where it starts. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion. To you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. <laughs> so right away, that's like a tip off that the person had been praying help help lord help lord and god um god responded you know and so they are now thanking god praising god and um i do think it, it's interesting it does talk about god's mercy though uh it says when deeds of iniquity overwhelm us you forgive our transgressions i need to check something in my um I think this is the revised standard version. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the revised standard version. When we were in church, the type that we were all saying was from the new international version. That's a different Bible, you know, English, but just a different version. And um, I have to admit, I kind of liked a little bit of the NIV style of wording. Um, you, do you have, that's an NIV. Could you just do, like the first first few verses of Psalm 65, yeah, because I thought the way it was worded, I I kind of liked it, and um, also because I think it just used the word sin instead of things like iniquity, because those are one of those words that I still have to keep checking on again. I mean, I know it means sin, but what does it mean particularly? And I'm always I'm like, hmm. So sorry, what verse? Uh, let's just do one through. Uh, four. Okay. Yeah. Praise awaits you, O God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. O you who hear prayer, to you all men will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near 
to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. Yeah. And then I just, I don't know, I just like some of the way it, it got worded in here. I thought, I thought that was good. But again, when, when our sins overwhelm us, then you forgive our transgressions. Now, the focus is on the gospel, but that phrase, I think, actually does connect to Romans. So when we get to Romans, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, but again, that deliverance God has brought, that's what the psalm is thanking God. And then it goes even into, again, um, on the grander scale, not just personally, but look what you do for the whole earth, God. You, again, you bring the goodness of, of rain at the right time, and that brings uh, produce that is uh, both not only good for humans, but even animals. It gets down into the, you know, the pastures of the wilderness overflow, so the wild animals, but also uh, the meadows close themselves with flocks. So both the wild animals and the domestic animals are, are cared for by God. So it's just, it's just a whole uh, broad praise of God and the goodness of God. But I, I think, again, it's pointing ultimately towards the Matthew text of the parable of the sower. Um, kind of kind of connects, connects in there. Um, and it was almost certainly in its time sung or at least chanted. Yes, these were actually songs. Yeah, that's that's um, we don't we don't have any way of knowing it anymore for sure. But there was they were sung and then through what monasteries, I mean, for each centuries, there was the chanting that was uh, when done uh, very beautiful. You know, we did we did work on it when we were in seminary. We we had to practice so we could try to kind of do it the right because you're supposed to kind of build a little crescendo and then kind of kind of tape you know like kind of kind of start a little soft and then get a little bigger and then kind of go back soft again you're like there's there's a real style to it that if it's done right is it, it is very i don't know draws you in i guess you could say um, but it's not necessarily easy it takes some some work okay so anyway it's it's just uh again we we start out thanking god for delivering you uh, even from our sins, and then just the whole joy of how God takes care of creation. So let's get into um, Romans a bit here. So this, uh, gosh, I love Romans. Romans is awesome. It's always worthwhile, but there's so much to remember. <laughs> Because what, what's, what Paul talks about in chapter 8, I think we're supposed to remember what he talked about in chapter 7. And then we're supposed to remember what he talked about in chapter 6. And even remember what he talked about in chapter 5. And it's sort of like, oh my goodness, uh, that's just, there's a lot to try to hold on to. Uh, very worthwhile, though. Um, and so continuing to read and reread the Book of Romans is an ongoing good thing to do throughout one's life for sure um, but so here uh, but if you can recall where we were last week we were reading in chapter 7 where Paul had been saying things like uh, let's see for we know the law is spiritual of, I, but I am of the flesh sold into slavery under sin I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate now if I do what I do not want I, I agree the, it's like I do I do not I do I do not I do, blah, 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 you know like like I know it's, it's like, so it's um, you know it's and we talked about this a little bit last week but I think you know we need to kind of keep the context you know Paul was trying to say Earlier he has said super clearly, by the way, though this is more like from chapter 6, that we are, we are no longer in bondage to sin, that we are set free from sin because by baptism we have been buried with Jesus into his death and his resurrection. So therefore we are dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is like absolute. That's an absolute that Paul declares. And... But then he does talk about how we still, well, that is absolutely true, but we still do struggle with the reality of sin in, in our lives. 
and that's what he's kind of talking about in chapter seven. When we were, when I was in um, campus ministry, like ages and ages ago, a long time ago, in uh, University of Arizona, Tucson, uh, we had like Bible study, and a young woman came who um, had just joined, uh, had hadn't been there before, and, and she was saying something that I guess perhaps as Lutherans, the rest of us were sitting there, we were just like, how did she? She was absolutely convinced that now as a Christian, she no longer sinned. She was like a hundred percent absolute that as a Christian, she no longer sinned. And I, we were all just kind of like, I mean, part of me is like, okay, she was embracing what Paul said in chapter six, Romans. Um, but then, you know, there's other parts of the Bible, like in first John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Right. You know, so so like I was I mean, I fully accept what Paul says as I take it as as true. Absolutely. But it, then he goes on to also say. This is true, but we also are not there yet. Like this is totally true, but we're not at the fullness of that truth. Like we're in the we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet, even if it's totally, totally real uh, or absolute. Um, so anyway, this, this young woman didn't happen to stick with our group super long. I hate to, I felt like we were, we were welcoming all, but we were just having a hard time because she was saying something that was so contradictory to what we thought also the Bible also told, told, told us, you know. Um, but Has she so, always been that way? Huh? Has she always been that way? I don't know. But, but I mean, someone had taught her that way, I assume. And I'm not <laughs> sure which church she... I, I don't think it was a Lutheran church. I don't and think being, so. Being a Christian, I think, is more of a journey mm -hmm. than a destination. Yeah, yeah. It's an ongoing. Um, so, okay, so here's another thought, too. So there's there's a couple churchy words, um, partly by, yeah, biblical, too. Um, so there's justification. All right, justification <laughs> is being made right with God through Jesus Christ. And if you think about what chapter six, what Paul says is, I feel like that's very much about justification. He's saying how we have been rescued. Our lives have been changed, but that's to me, that's justification because we've been made right with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, his, his death and his resurrection. That's, that's what has made us right with God. But then, then there's the other part, and that's kind of what also chapter eight is, sanctification, sanctification. And to me, the justification is, this has happened, this is done. That's been taken care of. Jesus took care of that for us. But then sanctification <coughs> is the ongoing being, being um, brought more and more and more in this journey, like you're saying. Like sanctification is the journey. Justification is more of an event. Sanctification, sanctification, being made holy, uh, reflecting more and more who Jesus is, or Jesus being more and more centered in our life, or you know, closer and closer to God. Um, that that's sanctification, and that's the Holy Spirit at work exactly. in us. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes my, in my way of imagining it, back to maybe a water image is if you think of a stone that's in a water, flowing water, um, over time that stone can be changed, uh, but it's, it's that ongoing movement of, and I think of water and baptism and the Holy Spirit, you know, it's the ongoing flow of the Holy Spirit uh, part of our lives. Uh, are we ever perfect in this life? 100% no, you know. <laughs> we will always uh, have fallen or you know, make mistakes or, you know, bad choices, sometimes even in great distress, perhaps feel like we're far from God. Uh, but God is always with us and the Holy Spirit is always with us. So we might feel far from God, but God is never, ever, ever far from us. So, well, so, so anyway, so back to chapter eight, which we're talking about today. Um, I guess what I, I like to just hide, when I read the passages in Romans, 
um, rather than to sometimes try to go deeply into what the argument and the thing that Paul's trying to say is I just like, I find a few anchors and I just was like, okay, this is something important and I'm going to hold on to this. And for instance, in the first verse, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like, you know, the law can accuse us, the devil can accuse us, um, but guess what? There is no now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because again, that's what Christ has done for us. And and I like the then the just the description of the Holy Spirit, because it's capital S. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. And so I, I also, um, I like to be reminded of that. And I think it takes frequent reminders of that, you know, that um, because of the Holy Spirit, we have been set free from a burden and the burden of sin. And that we really, God is with us to help us live as God would desire, you know, ways that are life giving. So then further down, um, this, I wanted to touch on this verse too. I don't know, let me see. Let me get to which verse that actually is. So verse, oh, we didn't read eight, one through 11, did we? Ooh, where, do you want to read that, Benny? Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of the death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, and to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. That's good, thank you. So- the new, uh, the new international version, yeah. every time it's word flesh was used, yeah. and here it's sinful nature. Yeah, see so that's good, I'm glad that brought that out because I was, I did want to touch on that. Uh, so there's, there's, um, there's two words in the Greek that show up in the New Testament for um, flesh, but they're, they're different. And so when Paul wants to talk about the sinful nature version, um, it's sarks. The word is sarks. Um, and then, but then when it's more about just the actual physical body, just literally our, <laughs> our body, soma, soma. That's, and almost 100%, if he's talking about how there's that part of us that turns away from God or is turned in on ourselves that's he uses the word sarks so it's, it's not saying he is not at all saying this physical existence is somehow bad it's saying the orientation the when we direct ourselves either to go to directly go against god or we're just all full of just self-centeredness like only me 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 kind of that's the sinful nature so I'm glad, see, that's where we need different Bible versions, so that sometimes, I mean, the word more literally is flesh, but that's getting more at the meaning. That's what Paul was talking about. Yeah. Yeah, like in the New King James, it says, 
for to be cardinal minded. And that comes from the Latin, which means flesh. Okay, cardinal. cardinal. Well, it's part of the yeah, yeah. Part of that word comes from yeah. Cardinal, which is the Latin. Is it, oh, is that part of the Latin version? And an Italian. Yeah. Okay. That's so. That, yeah, that is interesting. So anyway, just so to, just to get clear for sure, he, Paul is not saying you know we physical creatures are just automatically all just evil. It's it's more about what we orient to. It's almost more the mind than the body in a way, but. Um, Anyway, so, and because, I mean, if you can keep in mind that whenever you read this to not get confused, because the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith, is very body positive, I would say, you know. It was the Greeks who came up with this notion of splitting up the human into um, mind, body, spirit. Not a Hebrew concept at all. Not Old Testament, not biblical but because the New Testament comes in at the time Greek is the predominant language, it, it kind of seeped in a little bit. But, but so it's very important, I feel like, to say our bodies are good. You know, God created them good. Uh, but we do turn away from God, and that's, that's what he's talking about. Um, but he's saying, again, you have, we have been reoriented, <laughs> you could say. And yeah, and then and the final part of that passage, another little thing. I don't know um, the last couple of verses, like ten, eleven, or something. Um, this version uses the word "if," if, if, if. But if it is Christ, if Christ is in you, and then if the Spirit of Him who raised is in you, um, the wording there in the Greek is also could be because or since. So that it's really better, the if makes it sound conditional, but really it's a more positive statement. But since Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of right, righteousness. Since the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead uh, dwells in you, right? And that's, that's what Paul was saying. It's not a conditional, it's actually Sometimes in translation, the meaning isn't done the best way. Like, like they kind of missed a bit. So I just wanted to point that out because we don't, it's not conditional, it's since, since you are, <laughs> since Christ is in you, since the spirit is in you. So I like to think about when we say uh, part of the baptism is, uh, we, besides of course you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is we take a little bit of olive oil Usually we keep it in a little shell. Anyway, a little bit of olive oil, and you make the cross on the forehead. And you, you say you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. And I think that is also a very powerful statement. It's part of the baptism. And so every now and then, like, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. So that's, that's the... It is. It is real. Okay, we gotta get we gotta get over to the sower and the seeds, and we gotta get over to Matthew. All right, um, let's. Oh gosh, let me see. It is actually two parts. So if someone, if you're ready, in do you have Matthew in Matthew 13? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could you just do verse one through nine? Because. It is, it, then there's a break and it goes on to verse 18. So but let's just do one through nine to start. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on goodwill, where it produced a crop, a hundred sixty 
or 30 times what was sown. Thank you. I think, is that the end of that? Uh, just oh, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. He who had ears, let him hear. Yes, listen up, people. <laughs> okay, so um, so Jesus talked in parables, or taught, or talked, in either way you could look at it. And um, sometimes we want to say there's a meaning in a parable. I think it's actually, there's there's more than one meaning. You know, there's not, it, it isn't. I think that's the power of a story, is it can kind of get you new things different times you hear it you just yeah. you, you kind of come when in you're experiencing something else yeah life is again. different oh, then and yeah. you hear it you hear it you know like like just somehow you hear it even a different aspect or a different perspective i mean this is a this is this parable is well known and i know i had heard it i mean many 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 times in my life um but then i don't think i ever realized until a little more recently like this farmer is kind of odd, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just took it at face value. I never, I never really paid close attention. It's like, oh, throw some here, throw some here, throw some yeah. here, and it's sort of like, no, farmers don't win waste their their seeds. They want it to grow good, you know. Um, so th there's something in here to be reminded of uh, before we go into the types of soil is this farmer is um, very generous, you know, um, making a chance available even if it doesn't seem like a place where it's very likely that those seeds are going to grow. But does the farmer withhold? No. So, you know, Jesus went around and spoke to all kinds of people and he, he made the opportunity for a wide you know many many even even pharisees you know some of them who were the path type people who tended to be closed off and yet some of those same pharisees uh, were ones who did come to believe in jesus you know who who became followers of jesus so um you know jesus gave the good news to everybody he didn't he didn't withhold it from anybody and I think that's an expression of God's grace and God's goodness. God, God will always give everybody the opportunity. Um, now, what we end up choosing to do with it, um, there is free will, and um, you know, God never forces anyone to believe. It's 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 something that we are in control of, uh, but we know the blessing that comes. Uh, to, to have received that seed, that word of God, let it be in us and grow and become something that's life-giving, that comes through us too. Um, we'll, we'll, let's go a little bit into the next part though where it talks about the understanding the type of soil that was described there. So this picks up, it goes all the way to verse 18. So um, Lorraine, it, it starts up, I think it says here the parable of the sower. I think that's where it starts up on verse 18. Yeah. Were you able to find it where it's verse 18 in, in Matthew? Bring them here to me. Yeah, right. Um, mine says here the parable of the sower what is that verse 18 um, well bring them here to me he said i need your birth no this is the five loaves and fishes oh okay um do you do you have your yeah, bible okay. open okay well that's fine though that's okay well go ahead okay now here is the explanation of the story i told about the farmer planting grain the hard pad where some of the seeds fell represents the heart of the person who hears the good news about the kingdom and doesn't understand it. Then Satan comes and snatches away the seeds from his heart. The shallow, rocky soil represents the heart of a man who hears the message and receives it with real joy. But he doesn't have much depth in his life, and the seeds don't root very deeply. And after a while, when trouble comes or persecution begins because of his beliefs, 
His enthusiasm fades and he drops out. The ground covered with thistles represents a man who hears the message, but the cares of this life and his longing for money choke out God's word. He does less and less for God. The good ground represents the heart of a man who listens to the message and understands it and goes out and brings 30, 60, or even 100 others into the kingdom. All right. Interesting. Okay. A little different from that. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, that's why I, I think it's fun to hear different Bible versions read because it does give like a, just a little different angle on it, on a little different perspective on it. Um, so, so one of the things is that just to give another angle on also the understanding it, of course we could be like, oh, yep, there's the people that are like that or people like that. Um, but if you also kind of turn it upside down a little bit or like the flip side, so if someone who closes themselves off, so uh, as a disciple, as a follower of Christ, I, I don't want to be closed to God's word. I would love to be one who holds on tightly to God's word and that I don't let anyone or anything take, take that away. Um, that's why even though I don't try hard to memorize Bible passages. I'm glad that there are certain Bible verses, you know, or like I know almost totally Psalm 23, you know, I might not say it perfectly, but like I can, I know it in essence, I know it by heart. You know, I, I think it's really worthwhile to just have at least a few core good words from scripture that is just ingrained to us. Um, then if you take the, um, let's see, the rocky ground is, you know, sometimes life throws challenges at us and to, instead of, you know, turning from God at a time like that is to, to turn towards God, you know, hold on even more. And then, um, and let's see, we had a path. Rocky ground. Oh, thor and thorns is interesting because I always thought of thorns as the trial, but the thorns are more the things like the distractions, like getting caught up in getting the latest, you know, fancy car or um, upward mobility or uh, becoming the head of the PTA because you want status <laughs> or, you know, like getting caught up in social things and. Um, like social media is really good at pushing this, right? You know, you want to have this, you want to follow this person who always has this specific kind of purse or whatever. Um, so, you know, looking to God above material things, I guess. That's kind of what that would be. As a disciple, that's where I would want to be oriented is looking to God above, you know, material things. Um, and then finally, the good soil. And there, I think what I appreciate now, I'm reminded of more, is that what God can do through us to bless others as we are open to God, that's what I'm also hearing now, that, that hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirty, you know, as we keep trusting in God, being relying on God's word, how God could use us to bless others. So it's so I start to see good soil is not just a oh yay I get to be good soil. Like it's something that is a blessing, but it's meant to go on to bless others too. That's that's where I've grown in over time of seeing that part of what that means in a way. So. But again, there's so much in this. We could um, it, go back again and again, and you'll you'll kind of get another angle, another another perspective. I want to um, pay attention to the time, so uh, we'll 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 go ahead and share, join together in our Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may you all have a very blessed week and stay out of the sun. <laughs>